he was a very loving grandfather, I can say that. A very, if you met him, extremely warm individual, very, he had a real common touch with people, um, very down to earth, natural, uh, generous, I mean, a lot of positive qualities. He had a temper and, because he, he had very exacting standards and, like I said, he was brought up tough. You know, he ne it's maybe not clear, but he never went to school a day in his life. So he's essentially illiterate. He didn't know how to read or write. He had a little tutoring when he came to America. But, I mean, he didn't know how to read the paper. He didn't know how to, he, he, he had friends that read his contracts that helped sign things for him. Uh, he did it all through just common sense about how to take care of a business, how to treat customers. Uh, you know, he never forgot his roots. And so he, that's why he, he was insistent on trying to sell the product for a low amount, of, you know, for low cost and, uh, you know, and, and give them good quality because food for him was so important because he, he, he knew starvation as a child, right? At six, he was apprenticing to his father as a shoemaker. At 11, he's living away from home for two years, working in a bakery seven days a week, you know, through the night baking bread. I mean, that's how he grew up. He grew up tough. 20, 20 hours a day of, of work was normal for him. He had no problem with that. You know, he would do that you know, all year round if he had to. Um, so he was, he was dedicated to his work in a way that definitely impacted his family on some level. Um, so I don't know if I answered yeah. your question, but it's, it's complicated. Family, families are complicated. Families are, in business are even more complicated. They're very difficult, and I think most people can relate to it because I think it's a very common thing for brothers and sisters, you know, to have issues with each other at one level or another. You, but you take a famous business and, and what that meant for one's, you know, ego, you know, and, and one's career and, 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 you know, existence, and, and you create, you know, tensions and, it, you know, it, it, becomes, it becomes very difficult. But. Did you guys have any competition? Well, not in those days, um, and I don't, I don't know that they still, I mean, there are bigger hot dog companies, Frankfurter companies, I don't, I don't even know what they are, to, to be honest, I mean, I'm not in the business, I, my family's not in, been in the business for 25 years, um, but you got to remember, too, McDonald's and Burger King didn't exist, they weren't even exi in existence when Nathan's was in its heyday in, in the 40s and 50s, I mean, so Nathan's was the place for everyone to go, and, and that means, you know, to go at 2 a.m. on a Saturday night, that place was packed. Um, it was one of the few places open in, Brook in all of Brooklyn in those days. Um, so they, you know, they were the, the most famous place. I, I, you know, there are no other restaurants that's, that I know of that sell Frankfurters that, com com you know, compare to Nathan's. There, there are companies that sell them in the grocery store that, that do a bigger business than Nathan's. But I'm, I'm not actually a big Frankfurter eater myself, so I, don't, I, can't, <laughs> I can't tell you a lot about the, the industry. Uh, how much was your father able to learn from Nathan's and take it to his own? That's a great, great question. I actually, he learned a lot from my grandfather. My grandfather, just, you know, just his attitude, the way he ran the business, um, you, know, he, I, my, you know, my dad learned everything from watching him. Certainly, he had different ideas. He wanted to take Nathan's and franchise it too, but he wanted to do it with smaller stores, kind of like the McDonald's model, where his brother wanted to do it with the bigger stores in Times Square and Oceanside. Um, yeah, he was very successful at snack time. I mean, you know, when he first opened, it, and it grossed like a million dollars the first year. Um, it was, you know, it was a well-run, high quality, good location near Madison Square Garden. Um, but, you know, later in the, in, in the mid-70s, the crime wave hit New York City and it started, the night business deteriorated and the business started to get hurt back there. And also, he tried to expand a little bit and he found out how difficult expansion it really is. Even when you, you open up another store, two stores, three stores, to get the same quality, which is the same thing that my grandfather always feared. He only wanted the one store because he could be there and watch it and no one else was going to watch it the way he was. So. And he was right about quality, you know. You can't run it the same way. It's very difficult. Um, well, as far as the Holocaust, I'm sure there are cousins, but my grandfather was one of 13. Um, they all made it out. Um, his, actually, his parents came in 1925, but my great-grandmother died on the boat. That's, a, that's another story. She actually passed away on the boat. Um, so they all made it out, but I'm sure there were cousins. You know, I, I don't know. And some people left behind. Yeah. 
But you know, as far as like Nathan's, once it's, it became a public company and once it started franchising, it, it like someone pointed out, the stock r rose to 46, and then within three years it was down to three. It actually was failing during the 70s, you know, terribly. Um, the expansion didn't work. They bought Wetsons, which was a ha a hamburger chain, which was failing itself. So it, it was essentially bankrupt by the late 70s. It got resurrected briefly, you know, and slowly in the 80s, and it was sold in 87 when it wasn't, you know, that strong. I mean, it was, it was on, you know, it was stable, but it wasn't that strong. The reason it was sold was my uncle was 65, I guess, and his sons weren't either interested or capable of taking it over from him, and so he looked for uh, someone to sell it to. He didn't offer it to my dad or, or anyone else in the family, um, you know, and I'm, I'm sure it would disappoint my grandfather and my grandmother that it's not in the family, but that's, that, off, that does happen, you know, not, not every family can continue with a business for generations on. It's, it's a difficult thing, and you got to have people that are good at it and want to do it, so. Yeah, I mean, my grandfather, grandfather was very big in philanthropy. He, he, he was, you know, mem he, well, first of all, he gave money to the Catholic Youth Leagues as well as all the Jewish groups. You know, he was on the board of, of, of a number of them. He, he did a lot of uh, uh, charity where you wouldn't know that he was doing it in the community. In other words, if a priest called up and said, I need money to fix the church, he would, he would send money, and he would say, don't tell him I sent it. I mean, he was that kind of, you know, charitable person. He would take care of his workers unbelievably. He would pay for funerals. He'd pay for hospital bills. And he'd always used to say, don't tell him I did it, you know, because he wanted it, it, some sort of distance from that for, for some reason. Um, but, but he was extremely charitable and for many years. And my father was involved in, in Jewish organizations and charities, and my uncle was too for many years. So, yeah, and there was, there was a lot of of that kind of activity. There's a lot of community activity, like I said, and also for the workers, they held parties every year for all the kids with presents. I mean, it was a very communal family organization back then. And the, like I said, these guys were there 30, 40, 50 years. I mean, it was a career. It wasn't just a, what, what you think of now as a summer job for college students, you know. Um, it was, you know, that was a profession. Um, one of my relatives said that he was, he was making, in 1950s, $25,000 a year, which would be probably the equivalent of $120,000. Like he said, the, the, the salary of an accountant and he, as a manager. So they paid well. Gave bonuses every year. At the end of the year, there were bonuses, pretty big bonuses, for depending on how long you were there. So he really took care of people. That's why they stayed for so long, and that's why they were, you know, I mean, he had, I think he had some of the best workers that have existed in a restaurant in terms of speed and, you know, and so. Yeah. How many, how many of you have actually been to Nathan's? I should have Nathan's that. raise your hand. Right. Okay. Right. It's much different. I mean, the, the hot dog contest came about in the 70s, actually, early 70s. So, I mean, that didn't exist as part of Nathan's identity for many, many decades. But now it's probably the thing that most people know about. Um, and it just started in the alleyway. It was just inviting customers to, to compete against each other. That's what it all began. No one had any idea that it was going to become an actual competition, a sport that's on ESPN. So that's a very different world. Yeah. You know, an immigrant of my grandfather's background who had no education wanted his, his kids to have what he didn't have, and, and the same with my grandmother. So they all went, they all went to college. Uh, my uncle got a master's degree as well. All, you know, smart, bright, creative people, um, but, you know, I'm, I'm not sure what else I can say. <laughs> it, it became a very different business, and, it's a, and like I said, it's a very hard business to run when it's a franchise business and you're expanding and, and, and trying to figure that all out. But, you know, what my grandfather did was have one restaurant that grew and grew and grew slowly over time and basically kept the same menu for many years. It kept, he always wanted to keep it limited. But he was always open to my, my dad, to my uncle's ideas. I mean, they, they were the ones who brought in seafood. My dad brought in the, the deli. They had catering. But there was a lot of things that my grandfather didn't like about that because there was a lot of waste. And waste was something that, because he grew up so poor, was something he really cared about. Like, if, you, if a worker threw out half their food, then you would see an angry guy. 
okay? That was, that was not cool to him, right? Or, you know, that kind of thing. So, um, you know, old values about, about thrift and about, you know. And he, and, he, and he opposed advertising, like on the radio and in newspapers. I mean, his kind of advertising that he did was, like on the, four, on the 4th of July, he would, he would order a bigger frankfurter from high grade so that people would remember the size of that frankfurter and want to come back, right? That's the kind of advertising he did. Or when prohibition ended, he gave out free beer for the whole day and night. Or when a new store opened, they, gave, they, they, they sold, the, like in Oceanside, they sold the frankfurter uh, for free for the whole day and night. My dad did the same thing at a store. I mean, that's the kind of smarts that he had about, you know, attracting business and, and customers and, and taking care of them. But, you know, advertising, he just thought it was like, Throwing money down, you know, a pit. Throwing money in. Yeah. I think we have to go to class. Okay. Oh, but come back and bring your book and so we can buy your book. Yeah. Well, yeah. Whatever. yeah. Also, also, I'll just say the, the movie's on Netflix if anyone else is, is interested in watching the ending. It's a very exciting ending. <laughs>